In this episode, I sit down with my friend, Mr. Steve Brazel, to talk about our experiences with our brand new iPhone 10s. Right, folks, it's a big day. I'm sitting here with my good friend, Mr. Steve Brazel, and uh, we both got new toys. Steve got his first. I got mine about a day later. If you read the title to this interview, you know we're talking about the iPhone 10. This guy. Hold it up, Steve. Hold it up. Proud. I'm going to, but I'm clearing my messages <laughs> first. <laughs> it takes you that long to clear them? There you go. Right there. There we go. Yeah. There's and I put right on there. the live wallpaper, too. Oh, you're using that. You really hate your battery, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, we both have notes uh, on what we're going to talk about, but before we look at our notes, I just want your man on the street first impressions, you know, trying to hold back the Stockholm Syndrome, Apple reality distortion fieldness as much as you can. How do you feel about this device? Are you happy with your purchase? Yeah, I, I was talking to my wife about it. She got one as well. I, I looked at her last night. I said, so are you happy that we spent the money on this? Uh, and we both agree. We both absolutely love the phone so far. I mean, is it a perfect phone? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think, you know, it's like camera bags. You yeah. know, there is no, there is no perfect. Yeah. Um, but it's for, for the way I use things, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I was watching a bunch of reviews, you know, I, I lost count of how many reviews I've watched. In fact, I've got one on the TV right now that I'm watching on this phone. And they're all overwhelmingly positive. And I have to echo most of what they're saying is true. But I wanted to start this review, not, you know, from a contrarian standpoint, but more realistic, you know. And, and I want to talk about the things that, that are great about the phone, but also the things that aren't so great about the phone, right? So Well, yeah, and, and like you, you know, I'm not a journalist. So I was not one to protect myself from reading any reviews so that I had – you know, an unencumbered opinion of, of the phone. Mm -hmm. um, and all the reviews are overwhelmingly positive. Even what what impressed me was even people you wouldn't expect. Yeah. So Rene Ritchie on iMore wrote an amazing review in 24 hours. If you haven't read that, I highly recommend it. It's, mm -hmm. It is so in-depth. But Leo Laporte on both uh, MacBreak Weekly and This Week in Tech, uh, he's an Android phone user. And he said straight out, I was really wanting to not like this phone. But, you know, barring the price and some other small issues, you know, he, even he likes it. Overwhelmingly, people love it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I literally just got mine less than 24 hours ago. In fact, I activated it last night, and I think I picked it up. Well, it, I, it came to the house yesterday, and I had to take it to the Apple store to get everything sorted. So... I think I had it going. I had it was actually on AT and T around five o'clock yesterday. So less than twenty four hours in. So I don't have any data, at least personal data, on battery life or even you know I haven't even taken it out of the house yet. But what I will tell you is I'm coming, and this was makes this this discussion I think more valuable than a lot of them out there. Is you're coming from. A what phone? The iPhone 7, right? I had an iPhone 7, and I've had this since launch day. I got it early morning, you know, mid morning Friday launch day. Okay, so, so I, I've had, had more it, time with it and yeah. used it extensively all weekend. So I'm coming from this guy, which is the iPhone 7 Plus, a big, right. you know, the bigger phone to the iPhone 10, which is this guy right here. And while you're hold those up again, let's just point this out because this is clear. Turn the screen on on the Plus. Uh, it's actually off. Let me activate it. Okay. Because this part is clear that people need to understand is that the iPhone 10 is 5.8 inch screen diagonal, mm -hmm. whereas the plus is 5.5. So while it's in a much smaller form factor, it's only slightly bigger than my seven was. Um, it has a larger screen than I the plus. I think you have that reverse, Steve. So the and correct me if I'm wrong. The screen on this guy, which I've already reset it, as you can tell. So the screen on the plus, the seven plus, I'm pretty sure this is five point five inches. This the yeah, that, 10, that's what I said. That's what 10, I said. It's five five on the plus and five eight on the ten. No, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So five eight. So it's larger. But that's interesting. So 
the phone, the, the plus is physically larger. It feels larger in my hand, obviously. It is dimensionally larger than the 10. The screen, however, to me feels smaller. Even well, though it's bigger reason, because it's taller, right? Right. It is not 16.9. It's 19.5 to 9. Yeah. So that's taking some getting used to for me because it's it's a, this. I'm going down in size. I like it because it's it fits in my hand better. It fits like my older phones because I'm like coming from this giant plus to this more svelte 10. So it fits better in my hand, but I'm still... You know, my brain is trying to make the connection going from right. a larger phone down to a different aspect ratio. I only want to say it's And smaller. that's the key. That's it. It's 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 it is a larger screen, but it is a different aspect ratio. Yeah. And and so at times, especially depending on the app that you're in, it can feel like a huge screen mm -hmm. compared to my seven. But it can also feel smaller than a plus, even though it's technically bigger. Yeah. Yeah. When I first turned it on, it just felt long. I was like, this is like a long phone yeah you know so yeah. yeah it's interesting there's a lot of things to talk about okay so the form factor we talked about that 5.8 versus 5 well and let's throw in on the form factor because you were holding them both up yeah you had a plus i have i had a normal iphone 7 mm -hmm. and the weight is pronouncedly different it is it is much heavier than my 7 it is much lighter than my 7 plus <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. I, I don't Compared know. Compared to it's the negligible. seven, because of the glass, it's heavier front and back. It's for me, it's negligible. You know, at the same time, it's like it fits better in my pocket, and you know, we're splitting hairs. These things are are tiny to begin with, packed with technology. And I yep. look at this thing, the lightness of it and the size of it. Honestly, I keep seeing a thousand dollars. Well, but but here's the thing. How often do you pull that thing out? What when I bought this thing, I had already decided this is the computer I use more than anything. Yeah, that's true. That is very true. Yeah. It's and not yeah, a phone. And, and we use it for more things than just phones now. I mean, it is it is you know, we're we're basically Borg androids and this is our augmented tech that's currently yeah, outside really our, of our bodies, right? Our mistake is that we call it a phone. Yeah. Yeah. Cuz it's not it's like calling iTunes, you know, just a music app. Right? Yeah, or anything. Or any, yeah, don't get me started on that train. So you're happy with the size of the phone based on the smaller. Size for me is perfect. The reason I didn't own a Plus was I didn't want that in my pocket. I couldn't, I, I even when I have two hands available, I only use the phone in one hand like this. I balance it between my fingers no, like no. this. Look at you. And I use my thumb. No matter what I'm doing, even when I have another hand available. So I couldn't reach the corners easily on a plus. And the reachability with the double tap of the home button when I'm balancing it was also, you know, a knuckle buster. Yeah. With this, I don't have that issue. Well, let's talk about the reachability feature. So for those that don't know, um, on the, what I forget what, what version of iOS they introduced it, but... 11.1. 11.1, you could double tap the home button and it, if you activated the feature, it would shrink the screen down to bring the top of the screen within reach so that you can then tap things and then it would spring back up to the top. Are you happy with that? Because they've changed it now that the home button is gone. Now it's a gesture in order to bring the top of the screen down, right? Yeah, and it took me, I turned it on, I couldn't figure it out and I turned it off. And then yesterday I actually turned it back on and went, I'm gonna get this thing. It's a very small window. Basically there's a bar at the bottom of the screen that's used for a number of things. And if you drag your, your finger or thumb down on that, it pulls the screen down. Yeah. But it's not the entire dock height. It's it's about half the dock height. Yeah. So if you start too high, you go into a search. Yeah. Um, so it takes getting used to, but once you get it, it's way easier than a double tap on a home button. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still trying to get that. To be but you do you. have to turn it on. It's in general accessibility. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just a little toggle. You turn it on. You have it. Yeah. I can't live without that, especially coming from a seven plus. Right. So it's mandatory on the seven plus on this one. You know, it's it, I think it's still mandatory because the phone is so tall, but right. it's less it's less mandatory. You know? Yeah, I agreed. Yeah. Um, OK, the screen. Let's talk about the screen. Oh, boy. Yeah. So the screen is made by Samsung, but it's not an off the shelf Samsung screen. Uh, it is it is Samsung manufacturing to Apple's specs. Mm -hmm. So. I see a lot of people saying, oh, you know. 
other phones have had OLED. You know, it's not LCD. It's OLED, which has darker blacks, richer yeah. blacks. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a techie guy in that sense, but my understanding is you can turn off at the pixel level uh, so you get real black pixels. But – and somebody's going to correct me, I'm sure. But uh, while other people have had OLED screens before, they haven't done a lot of the – the behind the scenes magic that Apple did in the design and engineering, and more importantly, the software that runs the actual panel. So it just came out yesterday or the day before. There's a company called DisplayMates, and DisplayMate, or DisplayMate, DisplayMate, basically what they do is they review screens. Mm -hmm. They review color accuracy, they review uh, software management, they review, you know, angle that you can see the screen on, they review whether or not it's reflective. Mm Mm-hmm. And some of the quotes from DisplayMate on this screen made me think they were drunk at the time. Give me an example. Uh, So a couple things. First of all, this screen actually has two color gamuts. It supports sRGB, and it also supports the color gamut that's used in 4K TV called DCI-P3. But what's interesting is through ICC profiles – the phone screen will automatically switch which profile to use based on the content. So it dynamically switches color profile and ICC profile on the fly. Well, but based on what? So based on if it's looking at a photo that's of a forest and there's a bunch of green in there, so it's going to shift it. I'm guessing, you know, just like when you export a JPEG from Photoshop, you can embed an sRGB yeah. color profile. Yeah, yeah. So it's color profile management is my guess. Yeah. But but some of the things that they said, um, first of all, they said it has – I'm reading my notes here if I'm looking off camera. Uh, significantly higher image sharpness. Mm-hmm. Colors that are – for images, they appear with the correct colors, not oversaturated, not undersaturated. And this one was amazing. The highest absolute color accuracy of any display we have ever tested. Now, let that sit for a minute, right? I have next to me, I'm on a 27-inch iMac in front of me, and I have a a color-calibrated, self-calibrating NEC monitor for doing my photos Mm -hmm. next to me. Basically, what this is saying is I I have an auto-profile switching highly color accurate monitor on my phone. And this quote, people are going to hear this. I am not saying this myself. Yeah. This is from DisplayMate, who does actual testing, visually indistinguishable from perfect. Okay, let's unpack that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> visually, because I'm, you know, I'm going to play the, uh, the, you know, curmudgeon devil's advocate on this one. First of all, that statement is that automatically makes me suspect, right? Because who are you to determine what perfect is for one? Right? Well, and, and I'll, let me let me answer that one. Yeah. And that is they are not looking like the human eye. So when you go into a Best Buy to buy a television, all the saturations are turned up. Yeah. Right. It's not set to cinema. Right. Because visually that's pleasing to the eye. So a lot of people look at an iPhone and look at a, at a, at a Galaxy S8 which is more saturated, and they like the Galaxy S8. It's personal taste, but that's not what DisplayMate is going for. Yeah, DisplayMate well, is looking well, at lab that, actual So here's colors. here's where I'm going with this. So, and we've talked about this on Twip, you know, many years ago. The idea, if you break it down to a to biology, right? I mean, you know, we all have rods and cones in our eyes that that help us determine what colors are which, and all this good stuff, right? Everyone has a different number of rods and cones in their eyes. I'm colorblind. So they, Right, exactly. So people see colors differently. So that's a moving target. There is no perfect no, across no, mammals. No, it's not. How they interpret it is a moving target, but red is red. Who's right? to say what if, red is red, though? No, no, no. If you're taking RGB in yeah. an RGB color profile yeah. and you're doing uh, blue and green at zero yeah. and red at 255, that is a specific binary number and color. 
Yes. You may interpret it differently. Yes. But there is an accuracy. So when when you color calibrate your screen and you put the little sucker on the screen mm -hmm. and it measures, it's looking to see if that color matches the binary numbers that match what the color should look like. Yeah. That's how all of those color profile tools work. I get it. So yeah. that's what DisplayMate is working on. So if you look at a Samsung phone and you go, oh, this is better looking than the iPhone, you're correct. It does. It is better looking to you. Yeah, it's and that's okay. It's all subjective, but, right? But but what they're talking about is accuracy to the intended color coming from a source. Okay, okay, yeah, and you can you can measure that and quantify that. I get it. You can quantify that. And so here's one of their other quotes is, that was interesting. Yeah, even with all that measurement and all that math put into it to say this is what red is right here, and we're going to base everything on that. Right. My red may actually be green. Right. When I see the color red, I may be seeing orange, you know, and no one will yeah. ever know because you can't get in my head to see what I'm seeing. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. But I mean, let's be honest, as photographers, serious photographers color calibrate their screens. Mm -hmm. Now, I color calibrate my screen. I'm, I'm colorblind, but I color calibrate my screen. I know. If I go out in the world and I see the red of a stoplight or the, the amber of a, of a caution light. Mm -hmm. I see it clearly a different color than you do. That's one of the colors I have trouble with the yellow light on a stoplight. Mm -hmm. I see it clearly different than anybody else, but I know how I see it. Mm -hmm. Accurate for me is still a baseline. It's still accurate. It's still a baseline. Yeah. So when I color calibrate my screen, it's going to make it that I see it the way I always see it. It's still a baseline. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. two more quotes. I just want to get in there. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Apparently they have something called precision display calibration in this phone. What they say display mate is it's superbly accurate, high performance and a gorgeous display. Very likely considerably better. I love their, their, their little backdoor. We're safe thing, right? Very, very, very likely yeah. considerably better than any mobile display monitor TV or UHD TV that you have. Interesting. Interesting. And again, all of this is laboratory, right? It's like DXO on lenses mm -hmm. or cameras. That's all fine, but I don't like that camera, even though you gave it a hundred. Right. Right. It's personal taste, but still, it's an interesting benchmark. It, it's a data point. Yeah. Well, at least at least they're not saying. Well, you know, a lot of people are saying that this <laughs> screen yeah, is yeah, great. Exactly. <laughs> Now, Frederick likes the blue. Yeah. So the other piece of it is the OLED screen. So this is an OLED screen, the first OLED screen that's ever been put on any iPhone, which comes with some amazing benefits. Like the blacks are impossibly black, right? right. And it looks like the it really looks like the images are hovering above it. If you especially like I ran the Compass application. Have you run Compass on it? No, but I'm gonna now. If you run Compass on it, because Compass is on black, it just looks right. like a dial floating in your hand. It's ridiculous. But then, you know, I was reading up on OLED now because now I own an OLED screen. Oh, yeah, that's black. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to try it right now. Right, right. It's ridiculous. If you have an iPhone 10, run Compass and you'll know what we're talking about. Um, but OLED, they're telling me that OLED screens are, uh, they suffer from burn in from time to time. Well, we, okay. So, the latest Pixel, uh, which is a Google phone, yeah. reviewers, actually people who had a, a review unit, started seeing burn-in on their screen during the review period, oh, which is ridiculously short. Yeah. Um, OLED screens do suffer from burn-in, but they are normally – there are ways around that. I've heard um, – uh, from various sources that, you know, Samsung either does or is considering or something pixel shifting where the screen moves a pixel at a time every time it wakes up, something like that to keep it from burning. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what Apple is doing on this. And and only one reviewer had it for a week. Mm -hmm. Stephen Levy of Wired. Great review, by the way. Um, most of the other reviewers, to my knowledge, only had 24 hours before the embargo lifted. Mm -hmm. with the phone. Mm -hmm. Is that because they don't want people to find out that a week from now I'm going to be looking at this and find burn-in? I don't know. Yeah. I haven't seen it yet, and I've had it for a week. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's one of those... And again, it's not it's an off-the-shelf off Samsung things. screen. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, it's, and again, it's not an off-the-shelf 
Samsung screen, and the the Pixel isn't using a Samsung OLED. I think they're using an LG one. Yeah, yeah. I think. Well, we'll see. We'll have to keep our eyes on it. Um, we have a couple more things to go through here. So, well, on the screen, yeah, True Tone. We got to talk about True Tone. Oh yeah, thank you. So True Tone. This goes to my my putting on the photographer hat, right? So when they first introduced True Tone, I was skeptical. And I still remain skeptical because I understand what they're doing. They're measuring the room ambient light and then basing the image that you see on the ambient light that's in the room to give you a more pleasing, less jarring experience when you look at the phone, which is wonderful for 90% of the population. For the other 10% that are content creators and image makers and people that are chasing that color accuracy rabbit like you are and I am, it seems like that's like that's you know we're building a house on Jello when we're trying to <laughs> color See, correct. And I interpreted it differently. And Tell and me. by the way, there's True Tone Flash. Yeah. Which adjusts the temperature of the flash based on ambient light. Yep. That's different. This is a True Tone screen, and the way I interpreted it is it's not adjusting based on ambient light to show the screen more pleasing, right? Like night shift which turns off the blue lights at night so you can sleep better if you're on your phone. Mm -hmm. This, it, it, my understanding at least, is to maintain color accuracy. So we've all seen if my walls were brown and I'm editing pictures in here, that becomes very, very difficult to edit because the brown hue from the walls does affect what I see on the screen. Yeah, you're going to have a blue. So screen. if I'm in a room with fluorescent light green, or yeah. tungsten light, or incandescent light or LED light or color calibrated lights, yeah. right? Yeah. That's completely different. And the screen is adjusting for accuracy in those environments is my understanding. Yeah, but, but I, I understand that. But I think about it from the end user, right? So when you're color when you're calibrating, I mean it's it's like we said, it's a moving target and you're trying to get the the lowest common denominator or keep it down the fairway because you know all people are going to see this slightly differently. You know the image that you did, that you create. And speaking from a print photographer standpoint, that you don't know where that image is going to be displayed. Is it going to be displayed in a room that's right. daylit? Is it going to be displayed under fluorescent lights? Is it going to be, you don't know. And that's going to affect what the image looks like. What I'm saying is even with that, is it better to have a fixed target where you know I'm designing this for this range of usages and it's going to look okay in this range with a, with a true tone adjusting it on the fly based on the ambient? Does that take it out of the out of the mix and there's no way you can get an accurate print because you don't know what the end device is going to do to your colors, you know, based on where it's at. It just it seems like it introduces an infinite number of scenarios into how your image may be viewed because you may take an image that I worked, you know, 10 hours on to get it perfect. You put it on your iPhone and you go look at it in sunlight and now it looks different. You take See, it I don't think and look again, at I don't it think in darkness, it will. If it you looks spent different. hours if you spent hours on a photo yeah. on a color calibrated monitor yeah. and you put it on your iPhone 6, it's probably going to look different than my monitor mm -hmm. if my monitor's calibrated. Mm -hmm. I think the way I'm interpreting this is if I take that photo and I look at it on my iPhone 10 and I look at it in here with incandescent light mm -hmm. or fluorescent light, I'm going to see it because – the screen's going to know the room ambient light is 3200K, right, or 5500K. Mm -hmm. And if I go out into clouds, at whatever clouds is, 6500 or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, Kelvin, um, it's going to adjust so that I see the same picture. So theoretically, I am always going to see what you intended. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's it feels like a slippery pig. I don't know. Well, it'll be interesting to see. Again, I'm hugely skeptical of it. When I heard about this, I'm like, you're going to change the colors of my screen. Yeah. But if you do it well, I mean, look at photography, right? Phones have gotten good partially because of the magic sauce behind it. It's just a camera. It's the software that does amazing things behind the scenes yeah. to take great photos. Yeah. So if they do it right. This could be magic. Yeah, and I, I'm going to get into that. I want to get into the computational photography aspect of all this stuff that's happening right now, too. Um, let's quickly run through a couple of the other features in the phone. Um, Face ID. 
right? So now we can unlock the phone by just looking at it. What's your what what has been your experience with Face ID? Are you happy with it? Do you miss Touch ID? I miss Touch ID for a couple of reasons. I have my phone on my desk a lot, flat. Mm-hmm. And I'll hear it vibrate and I'll reach over and just put my fingerprint on a touch ID and look at it. Mm -hmm. Can't do that now. I have to at least pick it up to register. Mm -hmm. Um, But those small scenarios aside, which for me is not small, I do that a lot. Mm -hmm. I've had the phone a week and I haven't thought about it. Okay. (laughs) I, 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 I do have to pick it up, but it's not a big deal. Uh, Face ID is so fast. All of my all of my biometric apps, right, like one password, um, fresh books, things like that can all open with a fingerprint. Yeah. Which right. Is awesome. Yeah. Um, and now it's just you pick it up and they didn't even have to be updated because the touch ID apparently is a biometric API, not a touch ID API. Mm-hmm. So when they switched it to face ID, it just immediately worked. They did get updated to yeah. say face ID. Yeah. But um, I love it's that, so fast. Yeah. Here's the downside, though. You can do five fingerprints with Touch ID. I did four of my own, my thumb and my index finger on both hands, mm-hmm. and my wife's thumbprint. Mm-hmm. And I can't mm-hmm. do that. You can't register her face to unlock your There's phone. There's only one face. And so if I'm not near her and she needs to get into my phone for some reason, she has to do my code. And I don't have a four-digit pin. I have a complex code. Interesting. I wonder if they'll update that to allow multiple users to unlock a phone, because I could see several use cases when you'd want to like yours, for example, where you'd want to have multiple people have access to a device. So, well, put touch ID in this camera that's on my iMac. Mm -hmm. I mean, a face ID. Yeah. Right now, you've got a computer that can be used with multiple user profiles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going to at some point, if they migrate this to computers, they're going to need more than one face. So I'm guessing it's version one. Yeah, totally. But the overall review for me of face ID is it's fantastic. I love it. It's so fast, so easy. Um, Oh, and speaking of face ID, here's one of the cool things. On other phones, when I get notifications of a text message or an email, and I pick up the phone, I can read them instantly. Yeah. And it's always been for some people a privacy issue where they will go in and turn off notifications on the lock screen because they don't want somebody to go, oh. Mm -hmm. Well, now, it just unlocked. Um, Now, all it says is email message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as soon as you lift it up and look at it, the messages populate so that you can read them. Brilliant. And that's a key distinction because one of the people's complaints is when you unlock with Face ID, you then have to use your thumb or finger to slide up the screen to get to the desktop. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are saying, why can't I just look at it and have it go to the desktop? Yeah. And I, I believe that should be a toggle. Some people want to do that. For example, if you've got notifications on the lock screen still turned off, yeah. right? Yeah. I'd say turn them back on because they're private now until you unlock. Right, right. But you can't have it both ways. People complained with Touch ID that... I want to just see my notifications and I put my thumb on the touch ID and oh darn, it went all the way to the desktop. Yeah. And I missed the notifications. I think, yeah, it should just be a toggle, you know, absolutely. It should be a toggle. If you want to go to the desktop, fine. But if you just want to look at notifications, all that stuff people complained about before doesn't happen now. Yeah. On face ID for me, (laughs) it, it versus touch ID, it does what I think technology should do in terms of it shouldn't punish you for the sake of security. It shouldn't punish the user for the sake of having a secure device. You know, in other words, I got to I got to hold it, thumbprint, or oh, it didn't work that time. I got to punch in my code. Okay, now right. I can get in and do my stuff. It should just get out of the way and let me get to the thing that I wanted to get to. If somebody if an evil doer gets my phone and wants to get into it, then it should throw up roadblock after roadblock to stop them from doing it. But as a as a normal use case daily right. user, I don't even want to I don't even want to care about a password. I just want it to work. It's well, like and, and let's my, be honest, like turning on my oven, you know, I want to just turn it on and have it heat up. I don't want to tur- I don't want to go into it and punch in my code to allow it to heat up. It just just, just work every single time. Well, and, and let's be honest, it's not security. Touch ID and face ID are not security, mm-hmm. right? You want security, you're going to have to do touch ID and 
a passcode, right? Yeah. Something you are, your fingerprint or your face, and something you know, your passcode. Yeah. It's, it's all a balance of convenience with security. And I think Face ID absolutely nails it. I, I agree. How do, you, how do you feel about the app switching and the new gestures swiping up to, and swiping left and down? Completely and intuitive. And, and the double tap of a home button and then sliding through cards feels – I had to do it on somebody else's phone the other day, a client of mine. And it feels so antiquated compared to just sliding my thumb across the bottom of the screen. Yeah. It was – I've only I haven't even had it a week yet, and it is so intuitive that going back to a, ho a home button phone is weird. Yeah, the UI is completely natural. Yeah, it took me. I'm I'm used to it already, and I've like I said, I've had it less than 24 hours. So you know. Oh, know so let I'm me ask you this then. Yeah. Because uh, you've had it 24 hours, I've had it almost a week. Mm -hmm. Within a day, I don't notice the the horns. Oh, on the, the, the notch on the screen? Yeah, I don't notice the camera array notch at all. I still notice it. I still notice it. And and for me, that is one of the negative aspects of the iPhone ten is is that. I under, it but it's but it's a it's a compromise that I'm fine with giving up for the face ID and the you know, all the other things that, that the true depth camera gives you. So I'm okay with it being there because of what it's giving me instead. But if it were possible, I would love to just have the entire thing screen and not have that notch up there. It's not that obtrusive. In fact, it, you know, I mean, if you're that sort of person where you want people to know that, you, hey, I'm one of the first few hundred thousand people to get right. this device, they can see over your shoulder in the line at Starbucks that you have an iPhone 10, if you care about that. I mean, in but, an optimum world, would it be nice to have it behind the screen? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm guessing someday we will. Yeah. But for now, it's a trade-off I'm totally, totally willing to have. It, yeah, it does not yeah, bug okay me. One thing it. that does bug me, though, is that there's two stupid little things. They're really little. Uh -oh. The time was always on the right. Yeah. And the network indicators were on the upper left, and they've switched them. Oh. So I go to look at the time in the wrong place, <laughs> and you see the battery, but you cannot see percentage. That's you can only see percentage yeah. if you go into two two ways. Control center. So if you pull control center down, you see percentage. Yeah. Or you can add the notification center widget mm -hmm. for battery. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand manufacturers think, you know, well, we can't tell you 20% because it's a false sense of security because if you're streaming Netflix, that's different than if you're getting emails. Yeah. And 20%. But to me, 20% is a baseline. Yeah. For my daily usage, I know 20% is an hour and a half to two hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know that, and I've learned that, and now I can't see it, and I want that back so bad. Yeah, yeah. Hey, well, you're in a version one, so who yeah, knows what's exactly. going to happen. Exactly. Uh, okay, so app switching. We talked about reachability and emoji. And okay, emoji. so I love it. I love an emoji. I'm sending way too many of them. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but... You know, I still use, you know, icons and dropping things on text messages and mm -hmm. post-it notes and things like that. Yeah. Stickers, right? Yeah. Um, will Animoji stay? I think there's going to be a lot of people that get irritated with Animoji very, very quickly. I disagree. I disagree uh, from, from two standpoints. From the first standpoint, yeah, this limited set of little funny cartoon characters Animoji that we have, yeah, it's fun, it's novelty. Yeah, so those may go away. But services like Bitmoji and all these other yeah. services like that, if they integrate this kind of technology into their stuff where I can have a cartoon version of myself saying things where I don't have to, I could, you know, it could be first thing in the morning and I don't have my makeup on yet. I could still. <laughs> send, well, and that's send. the thing. If they open this to third party developers. Yeah. Because there's only, you know, so many faces right now. Right. If they open it to third-party developers, it's now it's a whole new ballgame. Yeah, you could be any politician you want. <laughs> yeah, that would be that that would be so awesome. I would love that. So yeah, it's, it has yeah. At least in the short term, it has legs. It depends where they go with it. Yeah, exactly. Like any tool can be used for good or evil. So yeah, so I'm bullish on it right now. I'm excited about it. Um, before we end this, so we're both photographers, right? So let's talk about the cameras. We're gonna do a second review where we just focus 
you know, no pun intended, on the cameras specifically. But Or pun intended. Or pun intended. Um, this thing has two cameras on it. It's got a 12 megapixel F1.8 camera on the That's back. That's wide angle. Right. And it's got this 7 megapixel F2.2 camera that faces you next to the right. screen. Right. I, the back and front thing always mixes me up because, like, who's to say what's the back and what's the front? Right. Um, so those two cameras, the reviews so far, I've seen. I've seen well, you two, left one out. A third Telephoto. Camera. The what? The telephoto. Oh, the telephoto, yeah, yeah. So on the back, on the back of the camera, for sake of a better word, not the selfie camera, right? The back, the normal cameras. There's two. There's a 1.8 wide angle and a 2.4 telephoto. And the reason that that really matters is on the iPhone 10, it's 2.4 for the telephoto. On the iPhone 8 series, it's 2.8. Mm -hmm. So you have a slightly wider aperture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the the reviews that i've seen so far and like i said i haven't even i haven't yet to take one photo with this phone so this is brand 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 new right you've taken a lot of photos with it so this is this is your football to run with i've and and qualify what i'm saying i've seen reviews that say it is not markedly better than say the pixel or some of the other competing super phones out there but it is you know, more of the same in terms of quality. Now that's, the caveat is those cameras are ridiculously like alien technology great already. And app, right. the Apple iPhone 10 fits in with those alien technology cameras, or is it better? What's your experience been? Well, and, and that's the thing. You pick up any DSLR today, even an entry level Nikon or Canon, and you're gonna get great pictures in good low light performance. I mean, okay, is it going to be pro low light performance? No, but you're going to get good pictures. Any cell phone, mobile phone right now, mobile camera can take great pictures. DxO, I think, released their scores. And I think this got a, a 98 on, on one area, but it was hampered by, they say that video on it still produces more noise than they want to see. Mm -hmm. But it outscored the pixel, as I recall, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, correct me in show notes or message me on, on social if, if I'm wrong. My understanding was that the iPhone did better than the latest Pixel on photography mm -hmm. and got a better overall score. But yeah, any phone you've got nowadays, if you've got a phone and you're taking pictures with it, be happy, right? I mean, you're getting good pictures. That said, the iPhone 7 was a really good camera. This blows it away to me. Really? Absolutely blows it away. So I'm a concert photographer. Yeah. So this weekend, I'm at OzFest meets NotFest. And I'm at this big amphitheater at 9 o'clock at night with nothing but stage light, you know, uh, uh, spotlights from the towers shining on the stage. Just slight light hitting people's heads. And I did a pano. And I zoomed in to look at noise. There was no noise. Really? This thing did an amazing job. I took pictures into straight sun. I took pictures that were, um, you know, at two o'clock where a, half of a singer's face was pure sunshine blown out and half of it was not. Amazing. Here's one thing I noticed that irritated me to death at first, though. I took a picture, a selfie of me and some other photographers there. And I looked at it and I went, how on earth did it capture this cloudy sky instead of just blow the sky out pure white because it was nothing but you know clouds, mm -hmm. overcast. And I went, our faces look normal though, but the sky is there. And I realized, I went and I looked and I touched it and it said HDR. Oh, oh let me turn HDR off. And in iPhones always at the top, you have flash, you have live photos, you all of that, and you have HDR. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't figure out how to turn it off. And I went looking in settings and under camera in settings, there is a new setting that is toggled on by default, auto HDR. Mm -hmm. Now for HDR, when you had the control, you could always say on, off or auto. Now, if that toggle is on, it will always do HDR if it wants it. And there is never a toggle. It just decides for you. Yeah. And I have to say, it was really good. It was way better than the HDR on the iPhone 7, pronouncedly better than the HDR on the iPhone 7. But if you turn that toggle off in settings camera, 
the HDR controls come back in your app. Yeah. The other the caveat, camera. the other thing to add on to that is if you turn it if you turn it on and leave it on as default, I believe there's a control in there that it will also save your original image. Yes, well. that is true. Right. So you can have the best. It doesn't hurt anything to leave it on there and let the computer do take its best guess at, you know, doing the balanced exposure. And if you don't like it, go get the original and do your own editing on it. Right. And I, and I, always, I like that that toggles there because it always drove me nuts. I, I when I when we went to Europe this summer or actually September, I only took my phone. As my which camera. is a ballsy move. <laughs> yeah, I did it. I did it in Italy once too, and did good. I didn't do so good in France this year, yeah. but I took only my phone and thought, let's see what happens. And it drove me nuts because when it would do HDR, I'd always I ended up with two of every photo. Yeah. yeah. So the ability to turn that off is nice now. But here's the other area I, I found neat, and you already had a plus. Mm -hmm. I never had the two time zoom lens. Oh. So at the concert, I'm standing off behind the crowd. And I take a picture of the stage, normal. And then I took one with the two times zoom, still tack sharp, mm -hmm. beautiful color, really well done. And then I did a five time zoom and a 10 time zoom. If you look at them at 100%, the five time zoom looks really good. The 10 time zoom is a little crunchy. It's, it's optical zoom. I mean, it's digital zoom. It's not optical zoom. Yeah. But... For a 10 time zoom off a two time lens, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, for something that fits really in your back well. pocket, by the way, you know. Say again? For something that fits in your back pocket, too. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. It, the color, the sharpness, everything about the camera, I really love. I think it's taken iPhone photography for me, coming from a seven to a new level. If yeah. you already have a Galaxy S8 or a Pixel 2, you're probably happy. Yeah, well, that, that's a good segue into this computational photography thing I want to talk about, which will blow out in another discussion, but I want to touch on it here. And computational photography is the idea of going beyond the limitations of physics with your optics and the camera itself and adding software to do magic, magic to sauce. that image. Magic sauce, yeah. So in this case, I want to talk a little bit about the portraiture mode or the portrait oh, mode. Oh, yeah. Right? Have you played with that at all? Uh, I have not played with it in a normal light scenario. I yeah. tried to play with it at the concert. Oh, yeah. And Mixed lighting. Well, it's not even that. I didn't realize it doesn't always work. Yeah. Yeah. It only works in certain lighting. And when I was outside with diffused light from overhead clouds, no matter what I did when I brought it up, it kept saying, subject is too bright, subject is too bright. Mm. At which point it won't even let you take a picture. That's interesting, huh? Yeah, which was really irritating. None of my cameras, none of my, my Lumix cameras ever tell me I can't take a photo. <laughs> well, actually, they do. They do. If it's, if you, depending on the mode you're in, it won't even click, right? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But when I have used uh, portrait mode, uh, I've tried it on a couple of different people. Some of them it works really, really well, like the black and white studio lighting one. Uh, works really well. Other people, it doesn't cut them out right. You get fuzz around the side of the head. Me being bald, it gets a little weird on the transition from my my scalp to my to the black background. Yeah. Um, but when it does work, it's magic. And I think the depth of field effect is better than what I saw on the old seven plus. I don't know about the eight plus. I haven't seen it. Interesting. Yeah, I'm definitely going to play with that. Yeah, it's interesting. In that that things are moving in that direction because as we hit the limitations of physics, you know, without moving into the quantum physics realm, <laughs> you right, hit the limitations right. of physics and what you can do with light in such a small device, you have to move into computational photography to start doing more interesting things. And I'm excited to see what's going to happen. Like with this true tone or the true depth camera being able to map i don't know how many points of data it gets from your face and then being able to change backgrounds and you know it's crazy what's possible in this little device right these are tools that cinematographers have over the years paid fortunes for yeah to have things like this 
um, you know, put dots on people and map them as they move around a room that now this thing does. I mean, you have to be fairly close, but, but computational photography, I think is literally what photography is going to be. Right. I mean, I agree. The fact that Apple and other manufacturers now, but Apple was one of the early phones to do it, um, decided we are going to take multiple pictures either combine them with our magic sauce or show you what we think is the best one through our own analysis uh, or do an in-camera HDR so quickly. Um, they're going to start using that for noise because you can take multiple shots of a scene, mm -hmm. right? Only The only thing that moves around generally if it's a still scene is noise. Mm -hmm. So in Photoshop, there's tricks you can do on photography like night sky photography to – Isolate where the noise is and remove it by using multiple exposures. Mm -hmm. I see that happening. Oh, yeah. um, it's a really cool time There's to be alive so technology-wise. Cool. Yeah. And photography-wise, so we're in a different world. Yeah. I mean, there, even things like um, I did this tutorial once on how to remove people from a scene where you put your camera on a tripod. Say you're going to take a photo of the Golden Gate Bridge and you want to get... You want to take a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge, but you don't want any cars on it, which is impossible, you know, unless you shut it down, which is also impossible. <laughs> so what you can do is take multiple photos over time, run them through Photoshop, use the median command within Photoshop right. and have it remove the deltas. Anything that changed from shot to shot, it yep. will eject. And it works. And it works like magic. Imagine being able to do that on your phone now. If you, know? you have a landscape with a lot of noise in the sky, I mean, there's other ways to reduce noise. But if you have a landscape with a lot of noise in the sky for some reason, that's a great technique for removing noise because that's all that moves. Because the 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 noise from the sensor, from it overheating, yep. whatever it is, those move around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And nothing else does. Move cars, so, remove noise, remove people from a landmark that you're trying. You're a tourist. You're trying to get a good shot of a pyramid, and there's always tourists yeah. around it. You can just, you know. Now, I will say this, though. I, I feel like we got to say this. Yeah. Because I saw somewhere the other day where somebody said, oh, you know, with phones now, everybody's a photographer. Yeah. No, you're not going to start, start shooting MMA. I'm not going to use this to shoot concerts. Um. You know, you're not going to do sports or high-end portraits or magazine shoots with it, although they've done televisions and magazine shoots with yeah. phones. And weddings. You know, I'm not going to capture, like, for example, the, the bands I was shooting this weekend, you know, um, Stone Sour or uh, Prophets of Rage. These guys move so fast that I, could, I had trouble freezing them at time at 500th of a second. I needed to be close to 800th of a second to freeze these guys right, right. in virtual darkness. Yeah, that's when you, so need the there real, was one band, you need a real camera for that. Yeah, there was one band at one point, it was so dark, we all just looked at each other and went, this is stupid and nobody photographed. And I went, well, opportunity to test. Mm -hmm. I ended up putting the camera at 16,000 ISO and 25,000 ISO. Wow. And anything? just to see, because I'm not going to get any usable pictures anyway. Yeah. Let's see what I get. They're noisy as heck, but still. Yeah. I got pictures. 16,000, I got usable pictures. You know what? That, that begs the question. I, I, we can end this right after this, but we've seen these, these rapid, insane, you know, sort of Moore's Law kind of advances on <laughs> smartphone digital photography over the past, what, five years, right? Right. Why aren't we seeing computational photography advances in Nikon's, Canon's, Panasonic's, Fuji's, Sony's, on and on? How come they're still f well, shutter speeds and ISOs? Yeah, you know, they are so fixated on making the better sensor, right? right? Um, that I think they, I, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people have said... Stop doing your own software menus, right? <laughs> Just do one where I can control it from the phone, make an app. Yeah. Um, they're so fixated on making the hardware. But Sony, for example, I have friends who shoot Sony and they hate their menu structure. Yeah. But they do some really cool computational photography tricks right. in the Sony cameras. Panasonic is the same way. Mm -hmm. Really, it's the two leaders. Yeah. But Nikon we're not seeing and anything Canon. like this. We're not seeing any portrait mode type stuff. I mean, they're doing they're doing for the most part. I mean, yeah, the sensor stuff, notwithstanding, which is magic, especially on the Sony stuff. But yeah. 
you know, we, we can do panoramas, stitching, and the, those sorts of things, but nothing like portrait mode or, you know, these, these, there's a million things you could do, or even like we were talking about with the whole idea of removing things from a scene and things that we haven't even thought of doing that you could do programmatically. How come they're not, I mean, with this big box, I mean, we have this little tiny sliver of glass and metal that can do that. They have much, arguably much more real estate and a bigger battery and proper optics, you know, to do some cool stuff, but they're not doing it. I'm, I'm just well, curious. I'll give you an example. I had a 5D Mark IV on one of my hips. I, I used a double rapid strap. I had a 5D Mark IV. Mm -hmm. oh, I picked up my phone. You're that guy that runs around, the, the dual gunslinger? <laughs> and, a, and a think tank photo belt. Um, I pick up my phone. I take an HDR with the sun behind the mountain, all the clouds, and the crowd Yeah. on the phone. Came out beautiful. I picked up my camera and did a three-shot in-camera Canon HDR. Click, click, click. Light blinking, processing, processing, processing. Here's your picture, and it was useless. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right? Complete ghosting. Uh-huh. Right. You can remove the ghost. Photoshop can remove the ghost yeah. completely ghosted people that showed up with one leg because um, people were moving. Right. Um, the the balance of the scene was horrible. It was flat. Uh, yeah, it just. Yeah, uh, I say uh, the camera manufacturers need to jump into this. In fact, I would I would be over the moon if someone like Apple, you remember Apple came out with that quick take camera back in the day, right? Never saw it. Yeah, they came out with a quick, it looked like binoculars. <laughs> so they came out with that. Oh, Apple I, I heard take. of that one. Yeah, okay. Uh-huh. Sony had the Mavic, remember the Mavica? Oh, with yeah. With the floppy disk in there? Mm -hmm. What if, you know, a company like Apple was to say, you know what, we're going to jump, we're going to throw a couple billion dollars at this and that we found in the couch cushions, and we're going we're gonna to jump into the proper photography market, knowing everything that we've learned with our iPhone adventures. We're going to make a pro-level, computational, anti-photography -photo camera that is just a beast. What have they The problem is they, they, they even killed their pro-level software, so I, I don't see it happening, but well, it would yeah, be nice. Sure, yeah, Anybody, yeah. Google... Apple, Google could if they do would it. come out with a software camera that did magic, I would love it. And it's there. It exists. Uh-huh. Yeah. But they got to get in Built-in cellular, all that stuff. I mean, come yep. on. It could be That's amazing. It. Yep. We're born too early, Steve Brazel, man. We're born too early. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right, man. Well, thank you so much for doing this. This has been like, uh, I intended this to be like a 20-minute thing. We went on for 51 minutes. But I, you know... I think this is important. This, is, this device is an important device. Yeah, and I think photography-wise, it's not just this one. For me, it's this one. But photography-wise, I think these things, Yeah. Uh, again, not going to replace pro gear for the right job, but these things put art in the hands of more people. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I, I, that's never a bad thing. And when we see the true depth camera start becoming pervasive on the iPads and the iMacs and everything else, I think things change then as well. You know? Yeah, I so. agree. I totally agree. Cool. All right, sir. Thank you. I'll let you get back to your day. You can go out and take some photos with your new iPhone 10. Uh, you got to do it. I want to hear your full review when you've had it a week or so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Send me those photos that you were talking about that you took at the concert, and I'll make sure they get into this video so people can okay. see the crunchy versus, you know, low light perfection that you were able I to do. I can do that. Okay. Cool, man. Steve Brazel. Thanks a lot, man. Later, buddy. All right. See ya.